Thank you. And um, I'm, uh, I'm sorry you've had to put back or replace your, your poetry evening in order to fit me in. We are, we are of course, very close to uh, Burns Night. But of course, uh, Alexander Burns was a member of Robert's direct family. Um, he was his great-great-nephew, I think, is the, uh, is the proper way of expressing it. Um, and the Burns, Robert Burns himself, um, uh, came from a family which was, was from here. The family uh, were from uh, the Mearns and then from Stonehaven and Montrose. And it was only Robert Burns' father, who was the first one, who ever went down to Ayrshire. I was speaking at a, um, uh, a Burns night in Glasgow a couple of years ago when I explained that um, uh, Glasgow and the Southwest's claiming of Robert Burns was completely wrong because he was from the Northeast. And I said, you can tell he was from the Northeast because he could read and write properly. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, I just about got out. Um, the, uh, and the family, of course, Robert Burns was the first one in the family to spell his name without the E. Robert's father always spelt his name with the E, and Robert's brother William always spelt his name with the E. Uh, Alexander Burns spelt his name, as you see now, and so did Alexander's father James, uh, uh, and all that side of the family. At some stage, the family in uh, Montrose started adding an extra S. And I'm not sure exactly when that happened. But the law firm of Burns it, the, and the family, uh, Alexander's father uh, was uh, a lawyer and had the law firm here, the, the biggest local law firm in Montrose. At some stage uh, in the later 19th century, that law firm changed its name to Burness. Uh, and nowadays uh, is part of Burness Paul, uh, which is, I think, the second largest law firm in Scotland. It no longer has a branch of Montrose, but this is where it started. Now, one thing which you can't gather from documents, and, I'm not, and I genuinely don't know the answer, is how Alexander pronounced Burns. Uh, because nowadays there is a different... Uh, there's a distinct difference in the pronunciation between Burns and people who had two S's who tend to go for Burness. Um, my, my, but they were all originally the same family. My uh, suspicion is that the pronunciation was somewhere uh, between the two, but we just don't know. Uh, one thing I'm quite uh, keen to know is, is, is there anybody in the hall tonight who believes they are uh, a part of the family, who, who have the blood of the Burns or the Burnesses in them. That's, oh, we have, <laughs> we, we have someone, which is good. I, 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 I was hoping that there, that there might be, because the family being so very local. Um, Alexander's uh, father, James, was uh, provost uh, of Montrose. James's father was provost of also James, his grandfather, was a provost of Montrose, and his brother Adam became a provost of Montrose. Uh, his, uh, his cousin uh, was the minister. So you couldn't get a more Montrose family uh, than the Burns. And I, I, I should like to uh, say something uh, you know, of humility, in a sense, because there's no way that anybody who's not from the town will ever know as much about the town as people who are, are from here and who've lived their lives here and, and learnt about the town uh, from their family and their grandparents and heard tales. Um, I'm probably the person in this room who knows the least about Montrose. And undoubtedly, uh, I will make mistakes, and undoubtedly there will be a mistake or two uh, somewhere uh, in the book. And I'm perfectly happy about that, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not standing here with the idea that I know a great deal more uh, than you know, that there'll be people here who know things I don't know that I wish I'd known uh, when I was uh, writing. Writing a history book's interesting. Now, I'm not going uh, to tell you 
if you like, a PC of the book. Uh, because you can read it in the book, and I want you to buy it. <laughs> 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 so it would be counterproductive for me to, to let you know what's in it. Uh, but I'd like to uh, start up. What I'd like to do is tell you some things about how I came to write it and how, as a historian, you go about writing a book and finding your sources and some of the difficulties with that. Um, I'd like to talk about some of the themes of the book. I'm going to make poetry one of the themes because it's actually, strangely enough, there's a lot of poetry in the book. Um, and finally, uh, a few thoughts about some lessons you can take from Alexander Byrne's life and what happened with him to the present day. Because one of the things when you do read the book uh, is it's amazing how in his, what he did with the British Army, particularly with the British Army in Afghanistan, uh, we've made the same mistakes again uh, in recent years that we made all those years ago. Um, but to start off with, why, why did I write this book in the first place? You know, why did I write a book on Alexander Burns? Well, probably, um, like a great many people who have heard of him, I, I first heard of him uh, when reading Flashman by George MacDonald Fraser. The very first Flashman book, the first in the series, has Alexander Burns as a very central character. And a very, um, very uh, and George MacDonald Fraser is a wonderful writer. Um, and uh, Alexander Burns comes over as a very sympathetic and, and charismatic character. And I actually haven't read Flashman, well, I, I read it back in, I don't know, about 1974 or something, and I haven't read it again since. But I still recall uh, MacDonald Fraser's uh, description of the death of, of Alexander Burns and his saying, run, Charlie, run, to his, um, uh, to his brother Charlie as he was uh, hacked down, and Charlie, of course, was also hacked down. Um, and it's worth saying at this point that another thing that motivated me was, in a sense, the fact that, that Alexander Burns has no grave. Nobody knows what, where he went, what happened to his body. There were conflicting accounts after he was killed in Kabul uh, as to what happened to him. Uh, a, um, an Afghan friend of his, a, uh, a Persian Shia uh, Afghan named Sharif Khan, um, wrote to his brother James uh, and said that he had uh, taken the body of both Alexander and Charlie and disposed of them in a well in the Armenian cemetery in order to uh, save them from further defilement. But the same chap also published an account saying he'd buried them in the garden and the two are not compatible. And, that, and I rather suspect that, um, uh, that he was merely trying to uh, give, uh, if you like, some consolation to, to Alexander's brother that he had taken the body and put it into consecrated ground, even if only the well in the, the, well in the Armenian cemetery. When the, uh, after the uh, disaster in Afghanistan in, in 1841 and the, the collapse of the British army there, uh, the massacre of much of the British army there, uh, when the British returned a year later, there were other people who were massacred, including Alexander Burns' boss, William McNaughton, who had actually been cut into pieces and had his body parts paraded about Kabul. Uh, and the, the returning British army managed to reassemble enough of McNaughton's body parts uh, for a burial. There's no evidence they even tried for Alexander, and we don't know. You know, he has no grave. And sadly, for somebody who in his time was extremely famous, he, he was more famous in his lifetime uh, than uh, Robert Burns was in his lifetime. Uh, Alexander Burns was, uh, he was a, a lieutenant colonel in the army at a very young age. He was knighted, he was Sir Alexander Burns, he was a companion of the Bath, he was a gold medalist of the Royal Geographical Society. He was, in modern terms, very much a, a celebrity, uh, known all over Europe. Um, and yet there's no memorial to him anywhere. Nowhere in the world is there any, not even a tablet in the church. There's nothing to Alexander Burns um, anywhere. And uh, 
as I, I go on, I'll explain partly how that came to be and how I believe his, his reputation was tarnished in a way which was really unfair, how he was, he was scapegoated and as a result of that fell out of the official historical uh, narrative. Um, but it was a feeling that this is a man who has not been justly treated by history, let, let, let's put it that way. Uh, and, and the feeling that he was a character who it would be worth knowing more about, uh, understanding why he became so very, very prominent at, at a very young age, and understanding why he then disappeared from history so completely, so completely he doesn't have a body, doesn't have a memorial, doesn't have a marker, uh, never had until now a, a proper biography in the modern sense. There's a 1967 biography by Philip Lunt, uh, which is basically a place of Alexander Burns' travel writings. It's not really a biography. In fact, the very first sentence, it says he attended Montrose Trades School was in fact he attended Montrose Academy. Uh, and, how, how, uh, and, and there are plenty of um, very definite sources that he attended Montrose Academy. And how you make a mistake of that kind, I'm not, not sure. Uh, and the rest of that biography, I'm afraid to say, really isn't very good and it's very, very slim. So this is the first properly researched biography of, of Alexander Burns. Researching a biography is, um, is difficult. You need to find sources. Most eminent people leave behind a collection of papers, a collection of their letters and diaries and journals and things. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, there's no Burns collection anywhere. There's not a central collection of Alexander Burns uh, papers. His brother James uh, was in his time almost equally famous uh, and was famous because, strangely enough, he became uh, an extremely senior Freemason was very uh, well respected in Freemasonic circles and re-established the, the Knights Templar in the uh, 1840s and 18, well from the 1830s onwards uh, uh, and James was extremely well connected uh, and according to obituaries of him uh, at the time of his death uh, was somebody who was in correspondence with all the most learned men in Europe, used to go visit them, uh, they used to visit him. Uh, but James Burns' papers have all disappeared too. Uh, so so there's, there's this very annoying dearth of, of central material. So a biographer has to go around gleaning what they can, searching the catalogues of all the major libraries, searching the catalogues of all the collections of people whom he might have known, looking for references to him. Now, of course, one of the first things I did was come to Montrose, uh, where uh, Alexander was, was born. And we'll, um, we'll come on to the, uh, the Burns house and its condition. That's something I'll talk about a bit later in the day. Um, but the, um, there we are. And we are now, we are here, what, we're 50 yards away, aren't we, from the house where Alexander was, was born. Um, Alexander's father uh, married uh, a Miss Glegg, who was the daughter of the provost. Uh, Alexander's father, James, married her when James was 19 and she was 16. Uh, and seven months after the wedding, uh, she gave birth to twins, one of whom uh, survived, uh, who was Alexander's eldest brother, James. The daughter, Anne, died. They went on, Alexander was then the fifth surviving child. They had a child every year, in effect. Alexander was born in 1805. When Alexander was born, um, in this house lived his grandfather, James, uh, who was provost of Montrose, lived his father, also James, the lawyer, and his eldest brother, James, uh, and three other children older than Alexander but also lived three unmarried aunts and one unmarried uncle. They all lived in that house in 1805. Um, the three unmarried aunts and the unmarried uncle all died in their 20s, uh, not only in the same year, so it doesn't seem to have been a, a fever or, or, or anything, but they, they all died in their 20s. And what the story is behind that, I never could discover, and I, I don't know. But I must have given Alexander an early acquaintance with death, if, if, if you like, because they, they all died 
while he was a small child between the age of between the ages of Alexander being six and the age, and twelve, uh, all those people who lived in his house died. Alexander left at the age of fifteen to join the uh, the East India Company, uh, and he sailed out. And there's one uh, I was happy to find one wonderful letter in the National Library of Scotland that he wrote back at the age of um, fifteen from uh, Chigwell in in. Uh, which nowadays is part of London, but in those days was a village. He wrote back how uh, Chigwell was much smaller than Montrose. Uh, uh, and uh, that's the only letter of Alexander Burns in the National Library of Scotland, that one from when he was 15 years old. I came up to Montrose looking for, um, looking for clues, uh, and I went into Montrose Museum, where uh, they were extremely helpful to me, and they first showed me uh, a medal, which I think is a Freemasonic medal, and another medal which I think is a medal which the school was awarded by the school, which they have in their collection. Uh, and then they said to me that they thought they had some papers in a cupboard. Uh, and they went and got them, and there, there are two bound volumes uh, in Montreux Museum, which best of my knowledge, are still kept in the cupboard. Um, one of which is the manuscript text of James Burns' History of Kutch. Uh, and the second one are copies of official letters of Alexander Burns from his earliest years in India and his very first explorations. Um, and this was a gold mine because there were, um, there was this you know, band volume of over 100 uh, official letters. When I found them, I wasn't terrifically excited because I presumed that either the India Office Collection in the British Library uh, or the National Archive of India would have the same letters, and these are just copies. Uh, but in fact, I was to discover, as I researched in both the British Library and in the National Archives of India, I discovered that the, the letters you have in uh, Montreux Museum exist nowhere else. They are the only copies of those letters. Um, exactly how they got there, uh, we don't quite know. And, and that's something else I'll, I'll come on to later, the things that are, are missing. And I should say, sadly, um, from the big band volume of Burns' letters, in the middle, there's a whole sheaf torn out. There, there are about 20 missing pages where, where something's been ripped. And of course, it's very hard to know over the course of a couple of centuries what happened? Did somebody light the fire with them? Were they taken to... Uh, one of Burns' letters sold on the internet recently for two and a half thousand dollars. So if someone had stolen them and ripped out 20, uh, that would um, potentially be valuable. But, um, and there's no, tele there's no way of knowing, I think, how long ago it, it, it happened. It, it looked to me like it probably happened quite a long time ago. Um, but the, uh, those uh, Burns letters here are, if you like, the main thing that remains in, in Montrose uh, from the Burns. Um, I said there's no, no central archive. There are plenty of, the, the British Library has plenty of Burns official letters, and it had his correspondence with a chap called Charles Masson, uh, who was uh, an explorer and archaeologist, and originally a British Army deserter, a very interesting person who I concluded after a result of my studies was probably uh, a double agent for Russia. Uh, and Burns' correspondence with Masson is probably, other than the letters here, the biggest single collection of, of Burns' letters around. Um, the National Archive of India. I, I went to Delhi um, and uh, visited the National Archive of India and I was given uh, a talk, I was given a lecture by the chap in charge of their archives room. It's very bureaucratic to get permission to study there. You have to go to the British High Commission and get a letter from the High Commissioner introducing you before you're allowed to access to the National Archives of India. And I got all that, but then I went through it and the chap was very formal with me and explained to me in particular that they had now computerized their index and I was only allowed to use the computer index, and you weren't allowed to use the old paper 
indexes. Indexes? Indices. I, I, anyway. Um, uh, so I went to this computer index and I typed in Burns and it came up with three documents. And I thought, this is awful. I've, you know, I've, I've traveled all the way to Delhi at great expense in order to look at three documents. So when the guy went out for his lunch, I went and found the old paper. Uh, in, and, and there were over 700 uh, entries uh, for Burns. And I tried as an experiment, because of course, once you find the entry, it, it has a, um, a serial number for the document, which is simply a number, like 272 stroke 531F or, or whatever. Um, so I thought, as an experiment, I will put, I'll, I'll take an order form and I'll just put in the number and put it in and see what happens. And I did, and I got the document almost immediately. And for the next uh, eight weeks of my life, I, I spent every day uh, in, the National Li in the National Archives of, of Delhi secretly reading the paper indexes and putting in, uh, um, uh, and putting in uh, requests uh, and reading through all the, of course, all the correspondence there is official correspondence, uh, reading through all the correspondence I could uh, about Burns and particularly about his earlier explorations. Uh, and I became very conscious while I was doing that that because, of course, uh, the, the indexes I was um, working from dated from the 1920s, from the imperial period. And the, um, uh, the documents themselves were in manila folders from the 1920s. Uh, and, of course, they have, on, on the inside cover, they have a list of when they were taken out. And I was very conscious that the vast majority of documents that I was looking at hadn't been taken out for 70 or 80 years. And some of them had never been taken out. Uh, uh, and that, uh, maybe you have to uh, be a historian to get a buzz from that. But, but I got a big buzz from that. It meant a lot to me. And also, I, I was even more conscious that being stored in, in the National Archives of India, where the, the air conditioning is very, very dodgy, uh, most of the time it's not air-conditioned. The climate is not conducive to paper lasting a long while. An awful lot of them were in very bad uh, condition. So I transcribed as much as I could. And the book actually contains more direct quotation, if you like, than, uh, the, than you would normally do. There are more, when I, rather than just saying, he wrote to him saying this, I give large quotes from letters all over the place. And part of that, and perhaps at the, perhaps at, to some extent with a loss of readability, but part of the decision to do that was this kind of desire to preserve the words before the documents vanish. Uh, and I felt that quite, quite strongly. So I had um, appeared doing that in the National Archives of India. That was very productive. Uh, I went to... Um, uh, T. Mason's Lodge in India, uh, and there I found um, interesting documents about the Burns family, who are uh, in India among Freemasons. Uh, and I should say I'm, I'm not one, just in case you're wondering. But they, um, uh, in India among Freemasons, uh, the Burns family are still enormously respected because it was James Burns, Alexander's brother, uh, who led the movement for Indian people to be allowed to become Freemasons and for lodgers to become multi-racial. Uh, he did that while he was Grand Master of Western India. He founded the first multi-racial lodge, which was called Lodge Rising Star. And I started researching all this with no knowledge of Freemasonry whatsoever. I, I, I knew pretty well nothing um, about it uh, and ended up having to go into it quite deeply because the Burns were so deeply into, into Freemasonry. Um, so that became uh, another useful source. I then journeyed to Booj because the, uh, the Burns family were outstationed in Booj, a remote, dusty station on the uh, outskirts of the empire, on the border of the empire. And that's where... Uh, James was posted for 13 years 
And Alexander was, I think, I think that was officially Alexander's station for the same period, although he, as an explorer and, and a diplomat, was travelling away from there, but that was, if you like, his home station. So the Burns family lived there in, in, in this rather obscure place. Um, uh, and, and this searching in Booge was difficult because Booge is dry. There is no alcohol allowed. Uh, and I had to actually go and see a doctor and get certified as an alcoholic and get a stamp <laughs> in my passport. Uh, so I, I do actually now have a stamp in my passport saying I'm an alcoholic, which is uh, wonderful. In order to be able to get two bottles of dreadful Kingfisher beer a day as, as the allocation they give to visiting alcoholics. Um, <laughs> but... The, uh, uh, in Buj, I wasn't able to track down much by way... In fact, I didn't find any documentary sources in Buj. I, I found, if you like, the place where they'd lived, um, but the uh, Buj is subject to earthquakes, and the, uh, all the buildings from that period, more or less, other than the, um, the local palace is still there, but most of the earthquakes from that... The build, all, all the British colonial buildings from that period have been destroyed by subsequent... Earthquake. So I could walk around and get a feel for it, where they'd lived, if, if you like. But I couldn't actually see where they'd lived. But what was interesting is when I went into the old palace and spoke to the curator there, um, I, uh, I said to him, oh, hello, I, my name is Craig Murray, and I said, I'm, I'm here researching Burns. And he just looked up, and without batting an eyelid, he said to me, oh, he said, Alexander or James? <laughs> uh, and that's interesting, because to be perfectly blunt, that's not a reaction I got in Montrose. Uh, and, um, and I think it is true that Alexander Burns is more famous in India than he is in Montrose. When I went to Mandvi, which is, where, which is the port of Buj, and where he started his expedition from, his famous expedition up the Indus River, and where they built the boats for him to go, they still build similar boats now. They still build big wooden boats there now that used to ply the Indian Ocean and still, still do as traders. Um, and there, um, I spoke to people among the boat builders, and they all knew who Burns was as well. And all of them claimed that their ancestors had built the boats for Alexander um, Burns, which can't all have been true. But, but the knowledge of him uh, in India is still, still quite strong. So they were, um, you know, they were very good affirming moments. Now then, uh, can we get the photos up of Alexander Burns again? Yeah, you want to go back to go back, go back to the Burns image. The, um, one thing about Burns is he was uh, well known for being charming, and his um, his sex life uh, became a uh, subject of some notoriety. Uh, and we couldn't work out why, because in every book you buy about the great game, because Burns is a famous figure in the great game, he appears in all the books about the great game, and every single book about the great game you buy has this portrait of him. And um, although I'm no oil painting myself, um, you look at that portrait and you think, how did that man have a great sex life? It, it, <laughs> it, it just doesn't work. Um, and, and that is the best-known image of Alexander Burns. When I was researching the National Library of Scotland, I found letters uh, in the John Murray collection from Burns to his publisher. And when Burns published the, his first great travel book about his journey in disguise to Bahara and to Persia, um, which was a, a bestseller, uh, and in fact, that book alone, uh, we're talking about Alexander and Robert, that book of Alexander Burns alone sold 20 times more copies than anything that Robert Burns ever, uh, ever did. And um, the publisher, John Murray, <coughs> wanted to put a portrait of Alexander Burns in the book. Uh, and that is the portrait that appeared in the book. But the book itself, when you look at the original John Murray first edition, does not label it Portrait of Alexander Burns. It labels it Costume of Bahara. And I found letters from Alexander Burns. And what had happened was Burns had, when he came back, he'd sat in London for a, a sketch to be taken of him wearing this Baharan costume. Um, and I found letters from Alexander Burns which said he did not want his picture in the book because that would be vanity. 
and that they could use the port they could use the portrait if they wanted but they had to alter the face so it wasn't him he didn't want his own face and i found a subsequent letter from his brother david to john murray confirming the face had been altered so in fact what you have there is a portrait which has been altered A, uh, which was formerly the, royal, the branch of the Royal Asiatic Society, the Mumbai branch. When I was there, um, I was going through minutes of meetings because Burns had been a member of the Mumbai Asiatic Society. And the same, the same building, it had sub-societies, if you like, which were, uh, of course, in those days, Bombay, not Mumbai, Literary Society, Geological Society, Archaeological Society. And Burns had been a member of all of these and contributed papers to them. Uh, so I was going through their minute books, and I found um, a minute in which the committee commissioned a portrait of Alexander Burns. And I said to them, you have a portrait of Alexander Burns. And they just sort of looked at me. It's a huge building. Um, and, they, and they said, well, let, let's look, because they have a lot of portraits. They don't know who they are. So we went around looking on all the walls at all the portraits, and we couldn't find this portrait of Alexander Burns. And we thought it must have disappeared. And then the secretary of the society who was there said, oh, we've got some old ones uh, in the basement that we took down uh, years ago uh, because we didn't know who they are and, and they were dirty and whatever. Um, so we went down to the basement and there were on their side in huge, big Victorian portraits, you know, in huge mahogany frames, this big on their side. Uh, covered, literally covered in bat droppings. And there were massive soup bats hanging in this place. Um, and, I pulled it, and I discovered the very first one I found was, was this portrait of Alexander Burns. And we know it's him because um, it's actually the twin by the same artist as the one in the Royal Geographical Society. One in the Royal Geographical Society has him in civilian clothes. Uh, this one has him in, in military clothes, wearing his medal of the Companion of the Bath. Um, and it's actually allegorical, because, because he was essentially a spy, uh, and you can't, the, the portraits become so dirty and discoloured now. It's actually, it, you, you might see here, uh, and you, on the book cover you can see it better, but there's, there's some sort of white areas here. I can tell you, that's what happens when you clean off back droppings with a handkerchief. Um, <laughs> but the, um, uh, if it were cleaner, you'd see it better, but here, he's taking off a robe which is red-lined, and that's the red-lined Baharian gown he brought with him. Uh, and it's an allegory, if you like. It's him taking off his native disguise in order to sh reveal the British uniform um, underneath. So that, that was a, you know, a great highlight of my, of my time. In Bouge, uh, I said they were 13 years in this dusty outpost. Uh, and there, at the time they were there, the British army was about 5,000 strong, in term, uh, uh, of whom about 150 were European, uh, mostly officers, obviously. Um, and um, the chaplain there, at the time they arrived, was a guy called James Gray, who's a, a Scottish poet of some, I mean, sort of second-rank poet, but, but uh, a well-regarded poet, who uh, had been a great friend uh, of Robert Burns and had actually taught Robert Burns' children. He'd been tutor to Robert Burns' children when James Gray was a young man. Um, and it, it was a fascinating coincidence that they arrived with uh, Alexander as the assistant resident and James as the uh, doctor in this post in India where there was somebody who knew their famous relative and had been close to them in this little Scottish colony. And what Alexander and James did was they brought out all their sisters to India to marry. Four of their sisters, they paid for them to come out, and all those four sisters found husbands in the British garrison in uh, Buj or in Bombay. Um, and the Burns family, like so many families, uh, uh, expanded and settled there. Now, I, it may seem an amazing coincidence that you know, they should go there and they should go to this outpost of Bouge and there find a chaplain who knew Robert Burns. It wasn't that much of a coincidence because the Scottish peasants in India 
was of a scale that I found mind-boggling. I had no idea it was um, as, uh, uh, as strong as it was. I was talking about documents and find when I very first, the very first visit I paid to Montreux's museum, um, I took away various uh, uh, photocopies of stuff with me, um, and a very nice lady there uh, handed me a photocopy of I think it was uh, I think it was an article from it was either part of a book or it was an, an old article from Montreux's Review, in which somebody was quoting Alexander Burns as saying that on the day they very first arrived in Calcutta, sorry, in Bombay, uh, they had dinner with 28 officers and merchants from Montrose. Um, now then, I, um, annoyingly, weirdly enough, uh, a week later my laptop was stolen. And I lost everything I'd found on my first visit to Montrose and a lot of other stuff and, and those photo copies because the laptop and bag were all, were all pinched, which was really annoying. I had to do it all again. And I never was able to find either the, the same lady or that, particular, uh, uh, or, or that particular quote again. Um, but what I did find was uh, that the presence of people from Montrose in India was absolutely extraordinary. There seems to have been almost no family in Montrose that didn't have somebody in India. And the closeness of that connection uh, and the idea of that connection um, uh, doesn't seem to me, and again, I, I could be wrong, I'm not from here, but it seems to me that the memory of the town doesn't really hold that memory in the way uh, you, you might expect. I think if we can come on to some of the other photos of folk down. I'll just talk you through some of these, um, the, the, these people. I should say Sandy kindly prepared uh, these photos of people. Um, we'll, we'll come on to, come on to that bit. Later. Yeah. Right. Um, James Mill, the famous philosopher uh, uh, from North Waterbridge, um, whose son John Stuart Mill was an even more famous philosopher. Um, I was, and uh, James Mill was at Montrose Academy with James Burns, with Alexander's father, and with Joseph Hume, uh, the guy who legalized uh, trade unions in the UK and himself had made a, a fortune from his, his time out in India with the East India Company, and, and who was himself a very interesting guy. Joseph Hume became the best friend of the Duke of Kent, who was Queen Victoria's father. And it was Joseph Hume who advised the Duke of Kent, not, who had settled in Germany, uh, that, he re that there was a chance Victoria might one day inherit the throne, so he really ought to come, to come back. Um, I was... I'd always been surprised that James Mill and John Stuart Mill were from Montrose because the name isn't very Montrose-ish. Uh, but I actually, and I only discovered quite recently, I, mean, I didn't know until a week ago, uh, that actually James Mill was James Milne. And he anglicised his name uh, when he got down to London. So John Stuart Mill is actually John Stuart Milne, uh, which of course would... would mess up the famous Monty Python drinking song, but the, um, <laughs> um, so, some people know what I mean. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, and James and John Stuart Mill were both in turn secretary of the East India Company. Um, and John Stuart Mill and Alexander Burns worked very closely together. Uh, uh, and J John Stuart Mill was a guy who was sending out many of the directions from London with relevance to Afghan policy. Uh, and they knew each other. They met in London quite, quite frequently. Uh, but they, uh, James Mill and John Stuart Mill uh, were, if you like, they were the senior civil servants in the East India Company. Politicians came and gone, went at the head of it. But probably James and John Stuart ha had the biggest long-term influence on British Indian policy. And incidentally, I, 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 I'm fond of philosophy. I own a couple of biographies of John Stuart Mill, including quite a recent one. Uh, and none of them mention his day job at all, ever, which is quite strange. And can we go on to the next chappy? All right, James Skinner of Skinner's Horse. Um, James Skinner's Horse is to this day, today it is still 
the premier regiment of the Indian Army. It's the Indian equivalent of the Blues and Royals or Household Cavalry or, 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 or what have you. Um, uh, James Skinner, as you can see, uh, was half Indian. His father, Hercules Skinner, uh, and James Skinner was uh, Alexander Burns' friend. They campaigned together. Um, his father, Hercules Skinner, was born in Montrose. Uh, and Hercules Skinner's father was also provost of Montrose. So the, uh, and so in the premier regiment of the Indian army was founded by people from Montrose. Still a premier regiment today. Alan Octavian Hume was Joseph Hume's son, a contemporary of Alexander Burns. Burns died in 1841 and, and was never photographed, sadly. Alan Octavian Hume, though the same age, lived longer and got photographed. Alan Octavian Hume, uh, born in Montrose, was the founder of the biggest political party in the world, which is the Congress Party of India. Uh, and, um, uh, and again, a, uh, uh, an extremely well-regarded figure in India who is almost totally forgotten in his hometown. Uh, and again, uh, when I say things about Montrose that are wrong, you can boo and throw things at me. But, but they, uh, th th there seems to be a great deal more recollection of Alan Octavian in India uh, than there, there is in, in Montrose. Oh, yeah. David Octoloni. Now, he's an interesting one because um, he was actually born, I think, in America, in Massachusetts. Um, his father was from Montrose, and his father, like so many folk from Montrose, was a Jacobite. Uh, and, and this area was uh, absolutely the heartland of the Jacobite rebellion. People have a rather false idea in their heads that the majority of the Jacobite army, particularly in '45 or it was Catholic and Highlander, was actually, uh, it was Episcopalian from the plains of northeastern Scotland, in the, in the main part. Well, obviously, they were different, disparate elements. Um, the Octolonies uh, left, for, uh, uh, left after Culloden for the uh, United States. David Octoloni, say, father from, uh, uh, father from Montrose. When Britain first invaded Nepal, uh, the British Indian Army, the Army of East India Company, was getting extremely badly beaten they, they, because they were fighting the Gurkhas, in, in effect. And they were, uh, they were losing very badly indeed. General Locke Deloney uh, was put in charge, and in uh, an amazing hill campaign, um, he uh, succeeded in conquering Nepal. Now, I, I should say I'm talking of history here, and the... The hip, you know, we, particularly as Scots, I think, wrestle with the imperial legacy because it happened. There's no good pretending it didn't happen. We, we, we discuss it. I'm, I'm saying what happened without imposing, in this talk, sort of moral judgments on, on, on what people did and whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. Um, uh, but David Octoloni, uh, conqueror of Nepal, a tremendous general, uh, became, uh, went on to become re British resident in Delhi, the most senior... British uh, official in Delhi, where he had seven Indian wives, um, who famously he used uh, every day, every evening, to put each of them on an elephant and parade them around town and force local people to, to pay obeisance to them as they went past. Uh, and David Dr. Loney, with his seven Indian wives, if you go into the town Kirk, uh, you will find uh, an inscription at the base, in the steeple as you go in saying that David Octoloni donated money for this steeple. Whether the Kirk elders knew he had seven Indian wives, I, um, <laughs> I somewhat doubt. But, but another absolutely fascinating product of Montrose, uh, who played, who again was somebody that Alexander Burns knew and worked with, uh, and these Montrose people all were, were networking together in, um, uh, uh, in governing India. Now, George uh, Buist, I, I, I've lived in Dundee longer. Dundee is the place where, in my adult life, I've moved about a lot, but the place I've lived longest is Dundee. And I still don't really know how you pronounce Buist, despite it being a, 
a proper Dundee name, Bust. You think, yep. the, uh, uh, very close friend of Alexander and James Burns, a uh, guy whose writing had a major impact on British perceptions of the first Afghan war, uh, founder of the Bombay Times, which later became uh, the Times of India, uh, which is the world's largest English language newspaper. We've had the world's largest political party in terms of membership. Now we have the world's largest English language newspaper, the Times of India, founded by George Buist of Dundee, actually born in Tayport. Uh, and before he went to India, he was editor of The Courier. Uh, and again, we, we've lost this somehow. There was amazing impact this part of the world um, had. Uh, 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 we, we, we've lost the sense of it. Very interesting man, very, um, and as, as you'd expect for someone from Dundee, essentially anti-imperialist, as was, as was Burns in many ways. Um, let's. Right. James Ramsey of Panmuir. The Burns family and the Ramsey family, the, the Earls of Dalhousie, the, uh, uh, James Burns acted in his capacity as a lawyer uh, in what they called agricultural improvement, uh, which, uh, to be perfectly blunt, consisted mostly of dispossessing cottars and tenant farmers uh, to build larger estates that could be more efficiently run. And the introduction of turnips and clover, the bringing down of cattle into the lowlands, um, the end of the run rig system. So that the Burns and Ramsey families were very closely connected here. Um, and even more closely connected in India, uh, where the Burns and the Ramses um, uh, worked together very closely indeed. Uh, Alexander Burns worked very closely with James Ramsey. There was extensive correspondence between the two of them. Um, and James himself went on to become Governor General of India uh, eventually. Um, and Earl of, again, I never know whether it's Dalhousie or Dalhousie either. That, that's a, uh, uh, and interestingly enough, also in Freemasonry, James Ramsey became the worldwide head of Freemasonry, and Alexander and James Burns became his number two. Um, and uh, in the Knights Templar, exactly the same thing. James Burns was grand preceptor of the Knights Templar, and James Ramsey was whatever the Knights Templar called, grand master, I guess. Um, uh, so, a fascinating connection. But again, an extra you can uh, you can find this in old, um, in no contemporary books of of Freemasonry. Uh, uh, but complete lack of correspondence between them. Al almost none of the correspondence has uh, ha ha has survived. Bits and pieces. Uh, and Charles Lyle of Kidimur, um, who are uh, regarded by many as the, the founder of modern geology. Uh, Alexander Burns uh, was a very multi-talented person and a very innovative scientist. And I'll come on to talk about that next. Uh, among the other things he did was he did, uh, when there was a huge earthquake in Kutch, uh, Alexander, as a very young man, was sent to investigate the after effects of the earthquake because it had altered the course of the Indus River, it had thrown up new mountain ranges or hill ranges, uh, and Alexander's job was to investigate it from the point of view of what effect this would have on military logistics. Uh, but he produced uh, geological work, and cross sections of, of, of fractures and things, of such fantastic uh, quality that they were used for the by the United Nations in 2002 uh, when there was a new coach earthquake on, on a disastrous scale. And in fact, only last week, uh, I was reading on the website that, uh, a, um, uh, that a modern uh, $600 million project to expand the court port of Karachi is using Alexander Burns' geological investigations as one of its foundation documents on, on, on how to do it. Um, and Charles Lyle, in his Principles of Geology, uh, quotes Alexander Burns uh, at length and produces many of Alexander Burns' diagrams as part of Charles Lyell's uh, principles of uh, geology. Uh, Lyell, a uh, major intellectual figure who uh, also 
uh, was Darwin's tutor at Cambridge. Um, and Charles Lyell, very controversial figure in Scotland, because Charles Lyell uh, was talking of uh, geological processes which took millions of years, whereas the Church of Scotland was still adamant that the world was 6,000 years old. Um, so Charles Lyell actually had quite a hard time of it. Uh, and uh, there's no doubt, I think, that Charles Lyell's, um, let's say, scepticism uh, uh, about some of the traditional views influenced uh, his pupil Darwin. Uh, so a major, major, major intellectual figure from around here. And again, a, a close friend of, of Alexander Burns. Uh, someone else I should mention in that context is uh, Hugh Faulkner. Uh, Faulkner uh, is viewed as the founder of modern paleontology. Uh, who uh, uh, he, together with, with a guy called Toby Courtley, first really, um, in a scientific way, established the existence of dinosaur species from fossils. And again, Burns knew Faulkner. He travelled with him around India uh, looking for specimens. Faulkner actually joined Burns on some of his explorations in order to take advantage of Burns' travels to get to places where he might find uh, fossils. Charles Faulkner from Forres. Um, uh, and, and the thing about Alexander Burns was he could discuss uh, paleontology with Faulkner, he could discuss geology with Lyell, and he could be accepted by them as an intellectual equal. During one of his uh, earliest expeditions, when Burns was trying to sail up the Indus and was actually, um, time, times the local emirs were trying to stop him. It was an extremely tense period, and at times his expedition was actually shot at. Um, in the middle of, of this pr diplomatic crisis, Burns noticed that at the mouth of the Indus, there were strange bubbles forming on the surface of the sea. He said they looked like floating liquid marbles. Um, and he investigated, and he saw that where the Indus joined the sea, uh, little particles of sand were coming off and fresh water was attaching itself to them. And then these were getting washed out to sea and fresh water being lighter than seawater, it was floating, they were floating like little liquid marbles. And he was the first person to describe this phenomenon. And uh, last year, uh, in uh, I think the Australian uh, Bulletin of Medicine, too late for my book, uh, research was published whereby um, uh, there's a new technology or, or, or new medical development for treating spinal cord injuries, uh, which involves floating in uh, a drug on, on liquid marbles. And the chief investigator said the idea came from him from reading Alexander Burns. Uh, so um, Burns wasn't just a spy, an explorer, a diplomat. He was uh, he was educated at Montrose Academy, so he was a Renaissance. Uh, he was a child of the Scottish Enlightenment. Uh, the Scottish Enlightenment was a period of great intellectual ferment when Scotland put out people into the world who were intellectually equipped uh, in a way so many of their counterparts weren't. And he could turn his hand uh, to so many fields. Now, Alexander was to die tragically in the first Afghan war. Um, Alexander had opposed the war, in effect. He was, um, he was a celebrity of his time. Uh, he was known for having explored Afghanistan. That's what he was famous for. Um, when Britain decided to depose his friend, Dost Muhammad, and replace him with a, a puppet ruler, um, uh, they did so uh, against his advice, um, very much against his advice. Uh, and Britain did so because they were worried that Dost Mohammed might be sympathetic to Russia. And we were, you know, this was the start of the great game, we were striving with Russia for influence in Central Asia. Burns had a decision to make whether or not to go ahead and support the invasion as he was ordered to do, and remember he was a military officer, uh, or whether he should resign or give up. And uh, after a tussle with his conscience in which he, he told the governor general he wished to resign. Uh, he, and then um, a few weeks later, he, he did resign. 
Each time he was talked out of it because the army convinced him that as he was the only one who'd ever been to Afghanistan, they needed him there to guide them in. In the end, he went along with it. The whole thing ended terribly, uh, and he was uh, murdered uh, or killed in an act of resistance, however you want to look at it. Um, the, uh, the, they are quite extraordinary. Some of the parallels to our own time are quite extraordinary. One of them is uh, that the, uh, the ruler we wish to impose uh, was from the Popolzai tribe or the Popolzai subset of the Durrani uh, tribe in Afghanistan. And President Karzai, who we imposed recently, was from the Popolzai subset of the Durrani. We were actually putting the same ruling family back in again. Uh, and in fact, had done the same thing uh, once before in the intervening years as well. You know, the, these historical resonances are, are very important. And the tribes, and most, uh, when you read the book, an awful lot of the fighting takes place around Helmand and Gadesh, which is exactly where the British Army has been fighting now, fighting exactly the same people now. And, you know, that back then, uh, whatever they called them, now we call them Taliban, it's the same tribes people fighting against the same foreign invaders. That's what it boils, boils down to. And our inability to learn the mistakes of the past uh, comes through, I think, very strongly. There's also something about Russophobia, because there, there never actually was a Russian plan to invade India. There, there just wasn't. They, they never even contemplated it. And yet, there were these tremendous scares about Russophobia. And Bitten, in 1834, uh, Bitten was smuggling arms uh, to anti-Russian rebels, or, or again, freedom fighters, depending on your point of view, in, uh, in Dagestan and Chechnya in 1834 to help them fight the Russians. Exactly the same things are happening today. And in fact, a British guy called David Urquhart, um, who the British government disavowed at the time, but undoubtedly was working for the British government. In fact, he immediately after went on to become first secretary of the British embassy in, uh, in Istanbul. Uh, David Urquhart was setting up and organizing resistance committees, which were called committees of Mujahideen. That was what they were called in 1834. Uh, and then smuggling the weapons to them to fight the Russians. So, uh, and I think at the moment, you know, we are seeing, unfortunately, another historic outbreak of Russophobia. Uh, and these outbreaks, uh, and, uh, and you can chart them, the, the, the uh, great jingoist outbreak, which is where the word jingo comes from in 1867-68, in, in uh, when there were stories of Russians having landed at Aberdeen with snow on their shoes. And they, uh, 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 be it the Russian Empire, be it the Soviet Union, be it Vladimir Putin, we've had this irrational... Russia has never, ever, ever, ever planned to invade the UK, uh, and I think never will. But, but we, we, we've always suffered the, this irrational Russophobic outbreaks in the UK, and I think we're going through one again now, and I think that's something I'd like you to take from the, uh, uh, from the book. Um, there are other uh, uh, lessons from, from history there about our, our failure to respect other cultures, uh, and also the fact that we were trying, consciously trying, deliberately, to stir up enmity between Shia and Sunni communities uh, in Kabul as part of our divide and rule policy there. Uh, and that, again, is something which continues into British Middle Eastern policy to this day. So I, th I think there's an awful lot uh, to learn uh, uh, from this. Um, and the tragedy of of Burns is, of course, that you know, he, he was to die uh, at this young age, having had so much potential, having understood so much of what Bitten was doing wrong, because he really did, he analysed very, well, he was, a, he was one of the last generations of uh, British officials in India who was not a racist, and he really wasn't. You know, he, um, uh, he had an assistant with whom he worked extremely closely, named Mohan Lao. And after Burns' death, Lao, who again is very, very famous in India, uh, Lao was never, Lao's career effectively finished with Burns' death. B 
because the British were becoming increasingly racist, increasingly racist in their attitude. Um, uh, and giving genuine uh, autonomy and responsibility uh, to Indians was something which ended around the time of Burns. And, and there are other things. You know, at, at that time, um, uh, half Indian, half British people were forbidden just before Burns' death from joining the Indian Army, for, for example, uh, and from joining the company civil service. You, you can actually, it's not just, you can trace attitudes in, in people's letters and what they wrote and what they said, but there are also institutional changes that show that racism was becoming very established in the British Empire. Burns, um, uh, Burns was a pre-Victorian. He died in 1841 when Victoria had only been on the throne for four years. Most of his life was lived as a Georgian. Uh, uh, and, and yet, and he came to be viewed, because he did, lead, he led a very active sex life. He, he had his own harem of women from Kashmir, but he took a bank with him on his explorations. Now the interesting thing is he, he did that, and Mohan Lal recorded that he did that, precisely because he knew that it would be a big mistake to interfere with Afghan women when you're in Afghanistan. Uh, and yet, in the, the established Victorian historian's explanation of what happened to Burns uh, and, and was that he was murdered because he was having affairs with Afghan women. In fact, there's no evidence of it whatsoever. I, I've been searching and searching. The, the only evidence for it at all um, is, uh, goes back to, to this chap, Charles Masson, who hated him. Uh, and would be liable to put calumnies out against him. But even if you, uh, even if you analyze what, um, what Masson said against Burns, all he said was that Burns' house was full of doe-eyed maidens, which it was, because he'd bought them from Kashmir. That's not incompatible with the real story of what actually happened. But that's what Victorian... Hist because Victorian historians had to come up with a reason why we'd failed disastrously in Afghanistan. And Burns became scapegoated. And he was a perfect scapegoat because he was dead, which is always good in a scapegoat. Uh, and he wasn't an aristocrat. He was born in that you know, quite small house just across the road. So in, in 1841, you, you've got somebody who's middle class and dead, and you've got a, a disaster, a military disaster. Who do you blame? You couldn't blame Lord Auckland, who's the main person whose fault it was. You couldn't blame Lord Palmerston, who's the other person whose fault it was. Uh, you would have to blame uh, Alexander Burns. And his taking the blame for the disaster is why he has no memorial, why he has, you know, he, he, he has suffered the calumny of, of history, if, if you like. And, that, and I'm making uh, some attempts to redeem him from that in my book. Uh, now, there's, there's a great deal more I could, I could say, but I think I've probably witted on uh, quite long enough. I, I, I should be um, delighted to, you know, reply to any, any points you made. And, I, and I'd like to finish by, by repeating what I said at the start, that I do realise that many of you will know, have a different take and in some cases a better take uh, on this story than me. And I, I thank you so very, very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>